Kamala Harris is surging in the polls. Can Trump still regain the momentum? Would it just come down to the Federal Reserve in the stock market? What about Iran and Ukraine that clearly don't want to see Trump return to the White House? August is usually a slow month, but so much has happened this August that it feels like time has literally flown. It feels like eons ago when Biden announced that he was dropping out of the presidential race. I have to keep reminding myself that it's only been 10 days since Kamala Harris officially became the Democratic Party nominee. How much can things change in just 10 days? A lot, apparently. In the space of just 10 days, Harris went from trailing Trump by 7 points in online betting odds to leading him by 9 points. Incredible! I was expecting a honeymoon, but nothing like this. Surely Harris' stellar ascent in such a short time is proof that politics are only about perception. Or at least in America. But how else can we explain the surge in her favorability rating over the past month? And if politics are only about perception, what's to stop her from becoming the next president of the United States? US presidential elections are decided by battleground states. A New York Times Siena College poll released this week shows that Kamala Harris has jumped ahead of Trump in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin by four points. New York Times polls are not known for their accuracy or predictive power. But Harris is also doing well in polls with much stronger track records in the 2016 and 2020 elections. The Insider Advantage poll has Trump trailing Harris by two points in Michigan. The Trafalgar poll has Trump ahead by only one point in Arizona. To see what's really going on, let's compare the August New York Times Siena College poll for Pennsylvania with the July poll. In the July poll, 43% of likely voters in Pennsylvania said that they would vote for Trump. In the August poll, 44% of likely voters said they would vote for him. In the July poll, just 42% of likely voters in Pennsylvania said that they would vote for Harris. But in the August poll, this increased to 46%. Harris picked up 4% of likely voters from third-party candidates like Robert Kennedy Jr. and undecided voters. Trump only picked up 1% of these voters. Another way of saying this is that the so-called double haters, voters who don't like either Trump or Biden, have been flocking to Harris since she replaced Biden at the top of the ticket. This is consistent with the fact that both Trump and Harris saw an increase in support from independent voters but Harris much more than Trump. Interestingly, the increase of support for Harris came all from men. The share of likely male voters who said that they would vote for her increased by 10 points from 34% in July to 44% in August. More surprisingly, the share of likely female voters who said that they would vote for Harris declined by one percentage point while the share of likely female voters who said that they would vote for Trump increased 5 points to reach 41%. If Harris did not make further inroads with likely female voters in Pennsylvania, she's benefiting from the fact that voters seem to think that her choice of Tim Waltz as VP running mate is better than Trump's choice of J.D. Vance. While only 20% of likely voters have a very unfavorable view of Waltz, 38% of likely voters have a very unfavorable view on Vance. Frankly speaking, I don't know why Trump picked J.D. Vance. Maybe by picking someone who is ideologically so similar to himself, he was trying to discourage anyone else who wants to kill him. That's a good reason if it's true. But Vance is definitely not going to help Trump, electrically speaking. While Harris has done better than I expected, 
there are some signs that she could be already peaking. In the weekly morning consult polls, she went from trailing Trump by two points in the third week of July to leading Trump by four points in the first week of August. However, in the second week of August, her lead fell back to just three points. Kamala Harris is running as a candidate of change, but voters are not convinced, or not yet anyway. In the latest New York Times-Siena College poll, 51% of likely voters in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin said that under Harris, either nothing will change or that there will only be minor changes to how things work. In contrast, only 14% of the respondents said that under Trump, either nothing will change or that there will only be minor changes to how things work. For good or for bad, voters still associate Trump with change. 37% of respondents said that Trump will tear down the system completely. If data is telling us anything about this election, it is that Trump remains the candidate for change. The only question is whether voters want change and whether they can be convinced that changes under Trump will be good. In the same poll, 43% of respondents said that changes under Trump will be very bad for the country. Change is unpredictable and scary. This is why people tend to only vote for change when things are bad, really bad. Think Obama in 2008 and Trump in 2016. In my view, for voters, especially independent voters, to take a risk on Trump, they need to feel that they have little to lose. In my view, the biggest question about the 2024 election it's just how badly people feel about the present and the future. The worse they feel, the better are Trump's chances. Only 18% of Americans are satisfied with the way the country is going right now, below the August 2016 level. Consumer confidence, while it is off the low in 2022, is much lower than August 2016. Yet, if Americans are feeling pessimistic, they don't seem to be doing much about it. They're still spending money like there is no tomorrow. July retail sales came in much stronger than expected. They're still putting money into the stock market. Government spending has been helping to prop up the economy, and the huge budget deficit and public debt do not seem to worry people too much. Also, the Republicans cannot offer tax cuts and warn about the deficit at the same time. And now with inflation easing, the Fed is soon to embark on a rate-cutting cycle. If the Fed were to cut 50 basis points in September, it is likely to reduce the sense of urgency for change further. Put simply, if the stock market rallies into the election, it will help Harris. If it sells off into the election, it will help Trump. So what would it be? Last week, I was pretty sure that the U.S. economy was slowing and that this was going to help Trump. This week, I'm less sure, given the surprising strength in the retail sales in July. With the latest PPI and CPI confirming the moderating trend in inflation, the Federal Reserve can make the case for a 50 basis point cut in September if it chooses to. Austin Goosby, the Chicago Fed president who's also a front runner for the Treasury Secretary position under a Harris administration, was predictably arguing for a big cut early this week. Everything can be manipulated these days, so why not economic data too? And then there are the geopolitical considerations. Last week, it looked like Iran was going to attack Israel, which should help Trump. This week, it feels like the Biden-Harris administration is doing everything it can to bring Iran on board to help Harris, who's pro-Hamas. Last week, it looked like Zelensky was trying to start World War III by invading Russia that would help Trump. This week, the U.S. Defense Department unsurprisingly declared that the U.S. does not support long-range attacks into Russia. The Democratic Party machinery is much more organized and effective than that of the Republican Party. So does Trump stand any chance? I think so. And this is only because I think Kamala Harris 
is a deeply flawed candidate. Most voters have yet to discover who she really is. I have no illusion that she will continue to avoid interviews and press conferences and that the mainstream media will treat her with kid gloves. But she has agreed to two debates with Trump. In these debates, she will have to defend Biden's record in office. She will also have to defend her previous positions on immigration in her liberal voting record. Based on her roll call voting record, Harris is the second most liberal Democratic senator to serve in the Senate in the 21st century. Her roll call record places her on the far left ideological edge of her party. Most Americans see Harris right now as a clean slate, but she has had a long political career. Trump has to force her to defend her positions. This is the only way he can still win. Pennsylvania is a crucial state, but winnable state for Trump. Abortion is legal in Pennsylvania up to 24 weeks. This means Harris cannot win the state on the strength of her position on abortion alone. The fact that Trump has closed the gap with her among female voters is very telling. Men are more impulsive and more prone to change their mind. I think Trump can win in Pennsylvania. I think he will also win in Arizona, given the immigration issues are much better understood among voters there. Winning in Arizona and Pennsylvania will be enough to win the election in November. It will be a close call, but I wouldn't be writing out Trump yet. Thank you for listening.